everyone and welcome back to my channel. My name is Rachel Ray and today is my favorite day of the week. Theory Tuesday, but on a Monday. <laughs> today is the Halloween special. Yay! Yay. <laughs> uh, I decided to take out another fall themed kit that I have in my stash. I haven't touched this since last year. This is uh, called After the Rain and this is part of the Cheryl Burke collection. So you might remember that Cheryl Burke from um, Dancing with the Stars. Today I have the weird and wacky Mr. Ray. Hi everybody. Okay, you're not weird and wacky, but <laughs> it was, I just had to say it. <laughs> and uh, you're more than welcome to sit and listen while I diamond paint and we talk about stuff. What are we talking about today? Today we are going to talk about the she. The she. Yeah, which is the fairies to anyone else. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, Irish fairies. Irish fairies. Woo. Um, yeah. Um, there was a lady on the in the comments. Um, I think it was Scottish bookworm that said that Samhain is a Scottish thing as well, mm -hmm. and that the month of November is actually called Samhain, and it's exactly the same in in Irish Gaelic. You know. Yeah. Um, like they're practically the same language. There's a big connection between the two of them, you know? Mm -hmm. So they also have fairies, and they're also called the she. Okay. But I, I don't know any Scottish fairy stories, so this will all be Irish ones and kind of from an Irish perspective, you know? Right. Yeah. We're going to focus on the Irish ones. Yeah, exactly. But th but this is definitely a, a rich vein of folklore in, in Scotland as well, and they'll definitely have their own specific ones, you know? Yeah. Um, I know that they have their own specific type of kind of banshee and it's distinct from the Irish one, and you know. Cool. Um, I believe it's always seen washing maybe or something like that. I think they might call it the little washerwoman or something like this. Um, but we, we can get into that later on as well. Okay. So do you, so they call them the ace she and then ace just means literally the people of, you know. Oh yeah. So they're the people of the she. And uh, do you remember? Is the she a place? Um, the she is both a people and a, and a kind of like a place. Oh, okay. The she are basically their burial mounds, like, you know, mm -hmm. usually associated with uh, barrow mounds from like the kind of Neolithic period, you know? Yeah. And kind of later, I think they might go into the Bronze Age as well. Um, and they're also associated with fo fairy forts. Mm -hmm. So any of the kind of like green forts and stuff like that, uh, standing stones, any kind of archaeological monument. You know? Yeah. That's mysterious and pre Christian. Right. Something uh, that can't be explained. Y yeah, and they're kinda like special places, you know. And the thing about them as well is that like you know, when they when they've started to get into stuff like um uh satellite archaeology and stuff like that where they're like literally looking at the topography from space mm -hmm. with LIDAR and stuff like that. I mean you've seen all of the stuff they've discovered in the Central American rainforests and stuff like that. Yeah. But they've done stuff like that all over the place and in Ireland they've discovered like loads of these kind of like ring forts and stuff everywhere all mm. different sorts of archaeological things and um, the Shi are usually associated with places like that okay yeah um, do you remember we were talking about where they came from the stories about where they came from in the last one yes so the Amergin and, and the Sons of Mail are fighting the two of Daytonin mm -hmm. and they come to the end and then they make an agreement and they split Ireland in half Yes. So the, the children of men get the above ground, you know? Mm -hmm. And the two of the Adonan, who had ruled Ireland for about 200 years at this stage, and they were like a magical people, you know? Yeah. And they got to live underground. Right. And that there was deals as well made between the two of the Adonan, like the, the goddess um, Eru, like the goddess of sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, she made a deal with them in her, in her triple form, etc. Mm -hmm. And... So there's a connection between men and the she, you know? There's but, an agreement. Yeah, there's an agreement. and But there's a kind of connection. There's that connection between them, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the Lower Gwala era and what they describe the world of the she and the places that the two of Daydonan exist, um, it, it's almost like it's like this parallel universe. Okay. You know? So it exists in the same place as us, but it's shifted. Like, you know? like a parallel it's a parallel universe, yeah. Right. But it exists in the same time, well, the same space as us, certainly. Right. You know? Um, but not the same time-ish. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I don't know. Um, yeah, so that's so that's the crack, like, so that's where the she kind of comes. But they from. have they have like portals and stuff. That's what. The... That's the, yeah. Well, this is it. Like, there are times when when the veil between our world and their world is at its thinnest, mm. you know. And one of those times is Samhain, you know. Right. And we were talking about this the last time where the the flock of birds and the tree headed bird called Ellen. <laughs> and the flock of red birds <laughs> and they come out and during the month of Samhain they ravage the land you know mm-hmm. and you start off it's the end of the harvest things are green you know mm-hmm. and then by the end of November everything's bare and you know yeah. it's been taken over like and it's a very dangerous time as we established to count pigs <laughs> because don't count the pigs do not count the pigs because <laughs> a herd of pigs comes out and starts eating up the greenery and every time you go to count them, there's more pigs. There's more of them. Yeah. I mean, so. it's not a bad thing if you like to eat pigs, right? But, but yeah. I, d- I, I, I got Maybe it. they cause a lot of trouble or something. Yeah, I think that's the story with them. Yeah, they, they just, they're the harbingers of winter and they eat all the greenery off the trees, you know? Yeah. Um, I suppose one of the things I wanted to, wanted to say here as well is that, like, the she are, are a real thing, like, you know? Like... In Ireland, I remember when I was a kid, mm-hmm. my dad told me this, was telling me this story about when he was a baby, and he was said something, he made some reference to wearing um, wearing girls' clothes, you know? And I was like, well, what's the story with that? And he went, oh, he said, like, every child in, like, on Valencia, where he grew up on the island that he grew up on, mm-hmm. every child before the age of three, back in the 40s and 50s, would be dressed as a girl, because the fairies steal children. They steal babies, oh. you know, and that's kind but of. But they what, only steal male babies. They oh, yes. <laughs> this this is the thing as well. A lot of the personifications of the she are female, right? And there's but there's male versions of them, but there seems to be a heavy slant towards. It does seem to be mostly women. Right? Yeah, it does seem to be mostly women. Like, and I think it. Mm. I, I think it might come from a, a part of the earlier tradition because, like, you remember that. The two de Donna are the people of the goddess Donna. Yes. And remember, I was saying that there's um, there's those trinity aspects to a lot of the the goddesses, mm-hmm. but you don't get that with the male gods. Hmm. You know. Okay. Um. Now the male gods. They're just not cool. Yeah, they can. They they are also magical. Like they can appear in different forms and stuff like that, but they don't have the power of the female gods. You right. know. Right. They're not, you know, they're 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 single purpose gods, do you know? That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. <laughs> <clears throat> so, but like, I I I remember being fascinated by that, and I asked like a lot of a lot of people, like my my girlfriend's um, grandmother at the time. I asked her, I asked a few other people about it. Like this was back in the nineties, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, they they kind of confirmed it, and they said that all of that was kind of dying out, and it would have, it was more or less gone by the fifties, you know, that sort of way. Hmm. Um, and I guess Valencia was just kind of isolated or something like that. Maybe they had older traditions, you know. Yeah, that makes um, sense. It was something you did. It, it it was something you just did as well out of that kind of um, because it, because it was tradition, and because what if I don't do it? What if something goes wrong? Right, is the impression I got. Okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's not uncommon to see pictures, even in the States, of of young boys dressed like, you know, women. I mean, in in the kind of, you know, they wore the smock kind of thing. And Oh, yeah. I mean, it, they're like those kind of smocks and stuff like that are definitely easier for managing a baby. 100%, <laughs> yeah. Um I don't understand why you would put pants on a baby, but anyway, I can't. I, <laughs> I can't remember any specific examples, but I well, I can actually remember one other example from when I was a kid. Um, okay, cool. When I was like about, I would say about ten or eleven, you know, um, we were up at home, and I can't remember. There was some cousin in, and my parents and the cousin were talking, mm-hmm. and then we were like heard like banshee and this kind of thing and we were like what are you guys saying like and they were like going oh well one of the uh, O'Donoghue's is passing away you know mm. over the water mm-hmm. and they say there's a banshee this would have been about 1988 okay and they say there's a banshee so we were like wow a banshee so we went down to the bridge and 
like there was four of us there. Mm-hmm. Now we're 10 or 11 years old, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, I swear I heard a banshee. <laughs> <laughs> do you know? Or at least something... Honey, do you realize how windy it is in this country? But Especially here? There seemed to be... I mean, I can't say it was wailing like a song, but there seemed to be something in the distance going like... Ah! Ah! Now, I don't think you're going to say... That's a fox. <laughs> oh, no, that's what I, I was going to say. That sounds like a seagull. But from like a big distance, like, and kind of <laughs> like, you know, that kind of, and then. I'm just looking at but that's image. But that's a memory I have from 1988, like, or right. 1989, you know? I and think you should hold fast to that memory, James. But I think, he, I think you're telling the truth. Do you know whether, whether <laughs> it was a sort of hallucination that it, a bunch of 10-year-old boys off in an adventure late at night down to the bridge could have, and I, I'm definitely open a to it. A hallucination? Be. But you know what I mean? You go to see a banshee, like, you don't want to come home and say you didn't see a banshee, like, you're, <laughs> you're 10 years old, use your imagination, you know? Mm. So there could have been some of that. But what I'm saying is that, like, e- even in the 80s, there was a belief in it, you know? Okay. And you, you'd be warned to stay away from somewhere because of the puka, or, you know? The puka is ghost, right? Uh, pukas aren't really ghosts because like ghosts are people you know people that have passed on Mm -hmm. but the puka isn't like the puka is is a she spirit Mm. you know um so i can't help but think of that little dog and anastasia every time i hear the word puka I don't know if you saw that movie, but (laughs) the dog's name is Puka. Is it really? Yeah. Oh my god. So, I always, I'm always kind of like, is it a ghost or is it a dog? (laughs) Anyway. I was going so I so I looked I looked into that kind of line of things, you know. Sure. And there's this folklorist called um, Frank Francis McCollum. Okay. Okay. And he he tells this story. Um, back, like, he was talking to people in the 1940s, okay? Mm-hmm. And he tells this story dating back to the mid-1800s. And it was told by this old guy, Blind Dan. You know? <laughs> now... <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, Blind Dan... Was there a deaf Dan? Blind Dan has this story that he was told when he was a child, you Dan know? the man. And this is actually the other side of the she thing. Because, like, where we have all the information, like the Lower Gwale Aaron and the Book of the Four Masters or the Annals of the Four Masters, you know, and stuff, mm-hmm. they're all kind of from the 8th, ninth, 10th century, you know? Right. And this would be an oral tradition that goes back longer than that, you know? Mm-hmm. And they recount this story as well that Blind Dan is going to tell you, like, so. All right, Blind Dan. 1940s, Blind Dan is in his 70s, right? Francis MacPollan is talking to him. And Blind Dan is explaining that the fairies are a group of fallen angels who had to repent after being cast out of heaven uh, just in time. Like, before they reached hell, they repented. And they never landed in hell. Right. They landed here on, on, in Ireland, like, (laughs) on on this planet, like. Um, What am I saying? And they were part, like, so because they repented before they hit heaven, or before they hit hell, they were partially... uh, what would you say partially repented and God said <laughs> yeah you know you can take up residence on the earth and walk around hmm. you know so in that sense it's almost like they're kind of uh, do you know they're good spirits or something like that but anyway good at the last minute uh, the, the thing about the she is they're kind of messers you know yeah I don't know if there's a reason to well this is this is the thing about it because the she are real you know, mm-hmm. they're um, I'm trying to how, how do I explain this? Okay, you've got to protect yourself from the she. You know, yeah, they're real. Mm-hmm. They don't take any messing. No, and that's the thing. Right. We've all got to live in this world. They live in a parallel world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now they can help you. But usually you're doing things to appease them, you know? Right, because you don't want to be on their bad side. You don't want to be on their bad side. So how do you keep safe from the she? The number one thing is you definitely do not call them the she. But? You do not call them the she. Why? 
because you're invoking them like so you don't want to invoke them and that's why people had all these like euphemisms they call them like the good neighbors the wee folk you know the blessed folk the folk and then they start calling them the fair folk mm. and then that's where the term fairy comes from okay but you definitely don't ever really want to talk about the she directly okay yeah mm-hmm. the other thing is that'll keep you safe is kind of iron or steel like so this is you know where putting like uh, horseshoes above your barn and stuff like that oh yeah yeah they think that this is where that comes from oh that they get they can't the, the iron keeps them away hmm. um keeping a baby safe you would get a fire tongs like a, do you know an iron fire tongs for picking up stuff yeah and you would open that up and put it across the baby's cradle keep the baby safe a giant metal bar on top of the baby yeah Okay. Yeah, that's well. Do you know? Do you know what I mean? They're in the crib, like. Yeah. And so you open it up. And Until what over. age, like? I mean, do we, what? What if it becomes toddler age, and then all of a sudden you've got a toddler with an iron bar? I would assume. Swinging it around. I would assume for safety. <laughs> I would assume for safety that they would have special cribs manufactured for this purpose with little. Do you know like dowels in it to hold yeah. to hold the tongs? Or do you know what? <laughs> you could just you could start building tongs to go across cribs. Yeah. Yeah. Sell the two as a set. <laughs> um, <laughs> With the dress. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the other thing that would keep you safe is, is tying a red ribbon around yourself. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, tying a red ribbon around yourself or wearing um, wearing a religious amulet, which. I kind of picture as because this is Ireland, like I kind of picture it as those miraculous medals. Yeah, like a little yeah, little, uh, little saint thing, miraculous or... medal, or the Saint Joseph one is a popular one. Did you have the? Uh, it was like two saints that. Oh my God! Yes, that's yeah. It's on a leather tongue. Yeah, yeah, with a yeah. saying the front and back. Yeah, and you put it under your clothes or something. That is exactly what will keep you safe from the sheep. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yep. And the last one, which is my favorite for keeping you uh, safe from the she, is uh, sprinkle rooms and people with urine. Ew. Yeah. No. Rooms and people with urine. Holy water, not so much. Urine, yeah. Oh my God. And check it out. The reason this keeps you safe is because <laughs> fairies are considered uh, too fastidious to abide this. So like fairies are literally too class. They're like, <laughs> <laughs> that is weird. Isn't That's it? really strange. Can you imagine advi- advising someone to do that? No. You'd be like, <laughs> okay, so I peed in the corner of the room. <laughs> no, no, I didn't say the corner of the room. I said the corners of the room. All of them go chop chop. <laughs> <laughs> the place is safe. The place is safe. Like. It's like literally like the the fairies are like, oh, I'm going to get this. Whoa, poof, jeez, I'm not going in there. <laughs> <laughs> What's the last time this guy had water? Yeah, yeah, for real. Like, um, OK, the other thing as well is like if you meet a fairy, don't under any circumstances accept anything from them. OK, like don't take food or drink. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, don't accept any gifts. No. Yeah. Um. If someone spends too much time in the company of a fairy, of the fairies, mm-hmm. they get a thing called fairy stroke. What? Yeah, poke na she. Okay, and uh, what what does that do? It, it makes them into almost like these kind of savants, you know? Okay. Like, Isn't that a good thing, though? Yeah, but like, they, yeah, I don't know. I think you get negative results. Like, they're kind of fools. But they know things, you know what I mean? <laughs> like they can't communicate anymore because they're always talking in riddles. But sometimes afterwards you can discern that the riddle's been prophetic. Right. Do you know that kind of way? I feel like this is just like a, a way to uh, explain away mental illness. It, it without a doubt is one of the mechanics of that, yeah. Like it, when I was a kid, anyone that was, you know, uh, not focused or something like that, or the people would say they were away with the fairies, you know? Yeah. Um. So that, but that's what it is. Yeah, you get you get fairy stroke for spending too much time with them. Like, 
And you have, so you have one foot in one reality and one foot in the next reality. You know? Would a certain kind of person be more susceptible to fairy stroke? Uh, like a farmer or someone with land? I think the people that are most susceptible to fairy stroke are the people that do crazy things like visit the she's hangouts at the oh, archaeological right. monuments and stuff like that. Yeah, so stay know? away from them. Oh yeah, that's the that's the last final thing is that the she are associated with things and places, and you should not mess with those things and places. Um, it also sounds like that might be Catholicism. Like, hey, we we don't want you to go hang out at these ancient places of worship. Yeah, there's a heavy dose of that, without a doubt. Um, I mean, my uh, my favorite interpretation is the old traditional one that they're the two they done and flipped into the underworld. You know. Mm-hmm. And uh, I mean, there's there's a lot of so I've 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 st- stuck to that side of it really, you know. Okay. But just there is definitely, and there's a whole series of um of kind of fairy stories where they're involved with Colum Kill, you know, who um who's a famous Irish missionary, you know. Okay. Um, I believe he might have even been the guy that brought um. Or is reputed to have brought Christianity to Scotland or something like that, you know. Hmm. Um, but there's a whole series of stories about them, and the stories kind of boil down to the she doing a series of tasks for him to see would he put in a good word with God and get them into heaven. Hmm. Mm. Um, but they're so they're associated with all these different places. Like they're also associated. Hang on, a, I'll switch to my, the notes. I'll consult the notes now from now on. <laughs> From now on, I'm consulting the notes. Okay. Um, yeah, they're associated with certain places, you know? And you remember I was talking about the fairy forts and all that? Yeah. Um, they come in many different shapes and sizes. Like the ones over here, like Loch and Abula and, and Cahargal that you can see. Yeah. That are big structures, like big 10, 15 foot walls, you know? Yeah. Um, and then small ones that where you look at them and you're like, is that a circle of trees on a ditch? And it is actually an, an, an ancient monument, you know? Right. Um, but you might not know that unless you were looking above it or something. If you were looking above it or, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. you Yeah, like I was saying, you know, you can yeah. see them from space easy enough and all that sort of thing. Um, space. You can see the she from space. <laughs> Spacey. So in a, in a survey, there's over 30,000 fairy forts alone in Ireland. You know? 30,000. 30,000 of them, yeah. Wow. And that's just the forts. Okay. Um, uh, uh, which would take in all your archaeological monuments. Then there's other areas like a lone hawthorn tree mm-hmm. on its own. Mm-hmm. Always the fairies never go near a hawthorn tree. That's what they love, <laughs> you know. Certain woodlands as well, like Lakeen. Um, I would say if there's fairies anywhere, Lakeen is where they would be, <laughs> you know. So the reason you want to uh, the reason you want to stay away from these places as well. Is because they'll put the, a curse on you, which is a pishog. A pishog. A pishog, yeah. And like, just to, like I said, the fairies are a real thing. Like, like I remember my grandmother talking about pishogs, like, or, oh, don't do that, you get the pishog out of it. Do you know that kind of way? Hmm. Okay. And um, so that's the story. Fairies are a real thing. Yes. The she are real. Absolutely. You know? <laughs> Stay away from all their places. Don't mess with their forts. They also have, there's these things called fairy paths, you know? No, what Pat, I would have. Paths? Path, paths. Oh, paths, sorry. Yeah, exactly. So, a lot of the stories to do with, um, with Pishogs and fairy curses and stuff like that, mm-hmm. they'll typically run like this. There's a hawthorn tree out in a farmer's field, you know? Yeah. And he gets annoyed with the hawthorn tree, it's in his way, he wants to plant. You know, he wants to put it down to wheat or whatever. Right. And he doesn't want to be going around this big tree. So he goes out and cuts down the hawthorn tree. That's it. He's got the pishog. Yep, that's it. Yeah. Uh, milk starts curdling in a in the cow's udders. Ew. You know? Um, I wonder if that's painful. He's, he has a new baby. The baby won't stop crying all night long. Oh, no. Maybe the baby's a changeling. <gasps> oh, my God. You've got the pishog. You know? Yep. yep. Um, he puts any time he puts anything down, it disappears. Mm-hmm. He can't find it again, and then it turns up in an unlikely place. He's been pishogged. Have you been pishogged? No, oh, no, no. I'm just very forgetful. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd, another another thing that happens now. This is this is such a this is such a common like fairy story that you can like literally go online and find 
like video of Irish people telling you this story that Ooh. this happened to them. I bet you'll tell it better though. Oh, no, no. I mean, this is a common story. And what it is, is that you're out in a place that's familiar to you, but you go an unfamiliar route home, you know? Oh, yes. Yeah? Yeah. Like, there's one video I saw on YouTube years ago. Like, I think, I can't remember who recorded it, but it was just someone went up and interviewed this guy. And he was basically walked walked down his field, you know? Mm -hmm. And he said, you see that there? And it was like I'm talking about. You can see kind of an outline. looks like a ditch and there's all hawthorn trees growing around it. Yeah. He was like going, that's the fairy fort. He goes like, and you know, we've been farming this land for like three generations, but you don't ever go near that. Like you don't want to bring the, the fairies on, you don't, you don't want to get the fish old, you know? Yeah. And then one day he was out there and one of his sheeps had got out, or one of his sheeps, one of his sheep had got out. <laughs> one of his sheeps is this. Um, <laughs> they got out and he was going looking for it. Mm-hmm. And there it was inside in the fairy fort. And he <laughs> said oh no Mm -mm. or uh, how like what am I going to do and he said eventually he was just like look that's the sheep in there I don't know how I got in there but you just need to get in there and just take it out you know so he went in there and he got the sheep and he took it out and he stepped outside of the fairy fort and he put the sheep on the ground and he went to run and then he didn't know where to run he was confused everywhere looked like the same place and it all looked like running back into the fort Mm -hmm. and then he didn't know what to do so he put his hand down on the ditch and started following the ditch around and then he got to a section that he kind of recognized and he jumped and he was out of it Hmm. and this is this is a really common story for she stuff like you know yeah that you'll be in one of their woodlands and you'll it'll suddenly the mist will come down yeah. And you'll try and walk back the path and you knew you came in this path. It's only been, you've only been walking for a minute, you know, mm. and you're lost. You're going around in circles. You're confused, you know. Yeah. Um, sometimes when you get out of, of the mist, there's this kind of Rip Van Winkle effect where you've been in there for a month, you know, that kind of way. Oh, wow, yeah. And everybody was worried about you and all that kind of thing. Um, the, the, this is co- very common with fairy stories as well as losing time. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that you just had big blocks of time. Mm-hmm. Now, I actually found this in my notes. Interesting, interesting little thing. What to do if you're trapped in a fairy fort. Now, the first thing you have to do is take your coat off and put it back on inside out. Then you what? put your left shoe on your right foot. You don't need your right shoe. And you spin around three times and then you'll be able to find your way out of the fairy fort. Now, the reason is that if you do this, the fairies seem to think, oh, we've, we've gone too far. This guy has lost it. <laughs> and they just let you go. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so if you act. You act cuckoo bananas. Yeah, cuckoo banana pancakes. <laughs> just and there you go. Act cuckoo bananas and you'll get out. <laughs> This is a common theme. So like, like we were saying, the ways to protect yourself is iron. Yeah. Yeah. Red ribbons are religious amulets. Okay. Um, sprinkling urine on stuff. Jesus. Or um, it, it just basically acting cuckoo bananas. Right. So, so I that's, mean, sprinkling urine on people and stuff is pretty. I, I love the way it's urine and I, I, I didn't find, <sighs> I didn't find anywhere where they said, uh, where it said holy water, which I thought would be one yeah. of the prime ones, like you know. Well, I mean, uh, but but yeah, and I love I love the reason as well. It's because like, do you know, why would I want to do that? That's disgusting, and it's like, but fairies think that's disgusting too. <laughs> <laughs> we are um, smart. So the so I guess the the crack is as well is like let's talk about different types of fairies and all that, yeah, and different types of sheep. Um, the the first one I want to talk about is the the Sula she. Sula she. Sula she. Slushy. Uh, Sula she. I think you would pronounce it. Sula. Yeah, because I think there's a a, a, a H here, even though it's not a vowel. But yeah, Sula she. I think that you is how you would pronounce it. Mm-hmm. And these are like uh, this band of fairies, like you know, this big cavalcade of fairies, and on. On the night, like Ia Howan, the night of Samhain, mm-hmm. they just come pouring out of that cave. 
do you remember the one we were talking about, the Aon Nagata? Yes. Traditionally, that's where they come out of. And if you, you'll hear their music, like their little fairy music, like, you know, coming over the hills, like, and they've got the inland pipes going. Coming out of the cave. They're coming out of the cave, yeah. And they, they just dance around the night. And what'll happen then is this is another one of those things where you'll, um, you'll get caught up in the music. Mm-hmm. Um, a mist will fall. And then you can't stop dancing. Like you're kind of compelled to dance along oh, to the yes, music. Oh yes, and you dance until you become exhausted to the point and where you they, fall. They and... dance you around the country. Yeah. Oh, okay. And this this happens at this is part of the reason why the guys took to wearing masks and stuff because the you know the she would look at them and they go well that's a, that's one of us anyway you know that kind of way, but they'll enchant humans with their magic and they dance them around the place you know. Mm-hmm. Um, For a bit of a laugh. Though. Yeah. What? Just some Friday night fun. Yeah, and I mean <laughs> the the thing about them as well is that like they they would co- what? Oh yeah. So the way to protect yourself from the shooter she, yeah. Okay. Is to have something holy on you. Of course. Or carry a black handled knife. That's oddly specific, isn't it? I mean, red ribbon, black knife. Yeah, red ribbons, black knives. I think you could make a very fetching outfit with that, like... I think so, too. Do a red what? ribbon belt with a black knife bet, hung from it. I bet that, that, you know, Irish men in that time period would have been exceptionally good-looking if this was for myself. <coughs> they certainly are now, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> um... Wait, what were we what were we talk oh the shooter she and that yeah the, <laughs> the other the other thing about the shooter she's they come out so they come out at Halloween you know sorry for distracting you no you're okay they come out at Halloween they dance around the place they see someone with a black handled knife or a religious item they're like, they're like nope leave them alone bye they're cool yeah. love your knife dig your book that's cool guys do you know what I mean man? <laughs> so that's how you protect yourself from them yeah. I guess another one of the the she things are these changelings. Yeah, changelings are like when a fairy swaps your baby for a fairy baby. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. Now this is tied in. Uh, this is tied in. Um, where is it? Like, yeah, this is tied into the Colin Kill thing, uh, according to my notes here. Um, that they're fallen angels and they can't get into heaven. They're stuck between heaven and, and earth, you know? Yeah. Um, and they need... They're, they're hoping that they can get these innocent souls of babies <laughs> and ascend into heaven, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, what, they, what they'll do is they'll, they'll take a healthy baby and they'll replace it with one of their own and then someone is left bringing up a she, mm. you know? And the other thing that'll happen then as well is that they can... You can become a changeling if you're an adult as well. But again, the changeling stuff most often happens with babies. Yes. But the she are real, I suppose is the point. I was just thinking that, is it, was it a mechanism of mother shaming? Uh, I, I think, suppose these I think are that there's possibilities, a... but... I I'm think only... that this, it's a, uh, like a lot of folklore and stuff. It, it's a way of explaining things, you know. Yeah. Um, like, why, why does my baby cry all night? And you know, yeah, and and they didn't have, and... they didn't have concepts like postpartum depression and stuff like that. You right. know what I mean? And so, it's there's definitely a sense that it was used to explain that. Yeah. You know, um, like I can't, yeah, I can't get my baby to stop crying, and they didn't know about like colic or. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it, it, it explains these mysterious and, and especially for a for a young mother or whatever like frightening things you know mm-hmm. like why won't why is my baby crying all the time like, yeah um, do you know and it's it, it's the same there's an awful lot of of she attributed stuff in agriculture as well oh really yeah there is yeah um, do you know like the like the main the main festivals the main festivals where where the veils are thinnest between our our land and the next is Samhain, mm-hmm. and then the other one is Bealtaine. Yes. And Bealtaine then 
is it February, March. Uh, it's in March, I think, yeah, at the beginning or the beginning of May, sorry. Um, and that's that's the beginning of the growing season, the season of growth, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Samhain is the end of the season, right? You know, and it they're two, they're two. It's six six six. <laughs> <laughs> they're two sides. They're two sides of the same coin, you know. Yeah, that kind of way. Um, but. What, what was the what, what were we talking about? Agriculture. Oh, yeah, there's there's so many things about agriculture. Like there's one that actually takes um, takes place at on the first of February, like during uh, Imbolc, which is like another one of the festivals. You oh know? yeah, that's the one. In February. Yeah, there's eight of them throughout the throughout the year, and they're kind of they're time to um, solstice and equinox and and venial equinoxes and all this. Right, you know? like there's Lunas Lunasa. Lunasa, yeah, and yeah, there's there's all these ones. Fuel. Yeah, but that doesn't count, does it? No, that's not one of them. No, the, but this, like, the at at those times, but particularly at Samhain and um, Bialtana mm-hmm. is when the veil is thinnest. Yes, it's almost like you know there are two spheres that are rotating around each other mm-hmm. and when you get to the door or whatever that joins the two of them you know it's when the crack is mighty yeah it, it, it is like the witcher this conjunction of the spheres type ideas <laughs> do you know what I mean yeah where the where the magic is bleeds into the world like right um, you get really strange happenings yeah that's why I mean People even to this day say that Halloween has like a special quality to it where people become overwhelmed with madness. Like as in they like, you know, take a notion that they wouldn't normally take or take risks or do things that is out of character. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're a librarian all year long and then suddenly you're sexy COVID like, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Jeez. Just really. COVID. No one is going to understand this. <laughs> um, <sighs> he he wanted to make a costume. Well, he wasn't saying he wanted to make one for himself. He was just saying in general, he would be surprised. So if you saw any sexy COVID people, well, I mean, people dressed as coronavirus in a in a weird <laughs> way, please leave us a comment because James has been obsessing over this idea. I do, I haven't I haven't even googled it. I'm sure I'm sure if I googled <sighs> it, I would come up with it in one minute. Please don't google it. <laughs> they definitely exist. Incognito window. Uh, That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> I have a story about it changing. Oh, you do? Yeah. Um, Is this a personal story? Or? It's not a personal story. Oh, no. Okay. No. No. Right. And then I met and then I met the baby that was stolen <laughs> that I was replaced with. <laughs> <laughs> they knew something was a little off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um yeah, so there's this lady, Bridget Cleary, right? Yeah. Except when our story begins, her name is Bridget Boland. And she's a teenager, like you know, eighteen or nineteen years old. Okay. And she's a dressmaker's apprentice. Oh, this is a while ago, so... This is in the 1880s. Okay. Yeah? hmm And it's the 1880s, and it's Clonnell, and she's a dressmaker's assistant. Yeah. Or apprentice. Apprentice. And she meets this guy called Michael Cleary, mm-hmm. and on August 1887, they get married. Oh, Yeah. And he's a, he's a cooper, you know, building barrels. Oh, Yeah. And this is in Clonmel, so there's a lot of like cider making and stuff like that around Clonmel. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. so so uh, Michael is is really employed in that, yeah. and you know, but he's working there. But after they get married, Bridget has to go and take care of her father Patrick. You know. Mm-hmm. So consequently, he's living in Clonmel, and she's living kind of in a town outside of Clonmel. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Now. As I said, she was a dressmaker's apprentice at the start. Mm -hmm. Somehow, anyway, she manages to get her hands on a Singer sewing machine. (gasps) Because there's an advert in the kind of 1888, 1889, Mm -hmm. um, in the paper, that's advertising her as a dressmaker and milliner. And she'll make you dresses and stuff. The apprentice. 
she she was an apprentice when she met Michael. She's had to move back to her home to a Oh, farm. right. Sorry. She put out the ad saying that she was yeah, because able to, to work. To look after her elderly parents, you know? Yeah. Got you now. Exactly. But somehow, anyway, we know that she that she was operating as a dressmaker and a milliner. And she was very successful at that. Mm-hmm. And so this is very unusual. Like, it's 1880s Ireland. And the, here's this woman with her own independent stream of income. And she's got a job and everything you know need a girl yeah exactly she's a girl boss like <laughs> <laughs> um so bridget's mother dies then yeah oh. so now she's only looking after her father patrick okay but they they have to sell the farm etc and patrick used to be a laborer mm-hmm. working inside in um Clanmel for a while you know yeah so he's entitled to a house from the company. Oh. Now, usually they wouldn't give it to someone who's retired and hadn't availed of it already, you know? Right. But the house that he's offered is just, nobody really wants in the company. It's nothing special. No, it's just a, an ordinary worker's cottage in the 1890s, like. All right. Which would be fairly, by our standards now, like. A bit simple. Yeah, like two rooms, maybe a maybe a scullery a third room outside toilet no running water you know yeah a class Loft. yeah maybe maybe well yeah um, an open fire maybe probably an open fire for doing all your cooking on and stuff but you know by it the smells so bad by the standards of the time pretty luxurious you know right, right 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 and as I said they're only offered that because nobody really wants it because it's supposed to have been built by the company on top of an old fairy fort mm. so nobody really wants it Mm. So they get it. Mm. Mm-hmm. So this is great. They're in Clonmel now, you know. And instead of traveling back to the farm on weekends and stuff like that, Michael Cleary moves in with them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And over the next two or three years, they still fail to have a baby. Huh. So now it's it has nothing to do with the dad being in literally the other side of the room. Well, <laughs> that's that's the thing. Um, no, it's the fairies. It's definitely the fairies. It's they, well, they move into the house and they can't have the baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then on the fifteenth um, of March, uh, Bridget is reported missing by her neighbors. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, I'm in the way there. Sorry. So on the fifteenth <laughs> of March, she's reported uh, missing by her neighbors. Yeah. Yeah. And the cops come and they start questioning Patrick and Michael. Yeah? Yep. And they don't really say anything. You know, they kind of put up a, like, just basically stonewall them, say, look, she does this sometimes. She's just gone away. She must be on messages. or She's gone off to do something like that, you know? Yeah. And the heat keeps turning up. And then Michael comes out with it and just says that she's been taken by the fairies. And he starts to hold a vigil for her, where there's a rotating cast of characters coming in and they're praying. That's suspicious. To try and get the fairies for her safe return. Okay. Then on the 22nd of March, Mm -hmm. they find a shallow grave (gasps) with her body in it. Oh no. And she's been burnt. (gasps) And then buried. So, by the fairies. Yeah, no, she was taken by the fairies, is what Michael said. Mm-hmm. But then it turns I've been out watching way too many Tear Crack documentaries. This, yeah, <laughs> this is the this is the fifteenth. So it turns out she was murdered on the fifteenth of March, eighteen ninety five. Yeah. Yeah. And she was murdered by nine people. What? Yeah, there were nine people implicated in her murder. Wow. And um, there is a crazy story. Um, where they start praying for her and saying she's a changeling and she's saying I'm not a changeling and Michael's saying oh you are a changeling this in this case they, well they had a full on ritual they think she's a changeling like yeah they had because a fu- she can't conceive yeah wow her own father like Bridget's own father said that she was um, that she was a changeling and that fairies had sent to change her. Her own father, Patrick, who she'd been looking after all those years, wow. said that the fairies had changed her out and that she was a changeling. Mm-hmm. And 
<laughs> this is crazy here. He was so convinced of it that Michael held her while he threw urine on her. Ew. Yeah, and they prayed over her by the fireplace to try and Poor cast out Bridget. the fairies. A hundred percent. Isn't that freaky? That's sad. Yeah. Well. Well. <laughs> the light fell over and we decided to take a tea break. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, no problem. Thank you. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Hydrate. <laughs> Let's get tea. I might wait a minute. It's actually a hot chip. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, poor Bridget. But I, I, I guess the reason I... This is a really famous story in Ireland, you know? Yeah. Because this is... It's 1895, you know? And... Like, the fairies are a real thing there in Clonmel. Mm. You know? And I think it... it like, it, it's, it's quite a famous story anyway, you know? Mm-hmm. And... To those people, the fairies are real, you know? Like her own father, you know? Yeah. Um... And do you remember the guy Francis MacPollan, mm-hmm. the folklorist, yeah? Yeah. Well, he was working in Ireland in the 1940s and he said in the 1940s that about, he would say about 50 or 60 percent of people had a really strong belief in the fairies. Mm-hmm. And he said that he had never met anyone over the age of 60 that wasn't well versed in fairy lore and how to stay away from the fairy and everything, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and like I like I said earlier as well, like we were often told, like don't. Now this is definitely something you would say to a kid: don't go up there. There's pukas. Do you know that kind of way? Right. Um, so, like the fairies are very much a living, breathing kind of thing, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, like a, a, another type of fairy that we could talk about, mm-hmm. and it's related to. Um, well, actually, you know what? Let's let's get the leprechaun out of the way. Okay. Before we get started. Yeah, because everybody's familiar with the leprechaun. Yeah, the leprechaun's a strange one, you know? Because there's no... Leprechaun folklore comes from um, Leinster, from North Leinster, you know? Kind of West Mead, Mead, I guess, up along the border there, you know? Okay. Um, and it... So a lot of the, the the kind of folklore like and it's it's seen as the the preeminent kind of Irish kind of fairy or mythological creature, you know. And there's even debates about whether it's a type of she, you know. Mm-hmm. Um sometimes they call it a solitary fairy, you know. But I know that a lot of the imagery involved around it back twenty years ago when I read a lot of folklore, you know. Mm-hmm. Um a lot of the thinking was that the imagery associated with um, the leprechaun, like th- that he's making shoes, you know. Have you ever seen that one? Yeah, I've seen that one. Where he's yeah. making shoes. Yeah. That that was a reference to the artistry that the two of the Adonan were supposed to have, mm-hmm. you know. Um, they're also kind of magical. Yeah. Uh, they're always on their own, um, and they're they're small, you know. This is var- This varies now. Sometimes they can be about three foot tall. Sometimes they're six inches tall, you know? Okay. But they're always small, usually on the smaller side, a foot, that kind of way, six inches, you know? Yeah. Small little sprites, really, you know? Okay. And, you know, they're associated with um, treasure, you know? Mm -hmm. A pot of gold and all that. Right. But in the original folklore, from what I can see, the, the thinking is that they got their treasure from the successive waves of invasion of Ireland. Hmm. You know, that each time there'd be a new wave, mm-hmm. people would do what people usually do and go out and bury a hoard. Right. You know, bury their gold coins, bury anything of value in case it gets taken in the in the conflagration. Like. Yeah. And that the, the leprechauns are the keepers of this, you know? The gold of the two of it on, and of course, because, you know, they were hid their hoards as well when the Venetians showed up. Mm-hmm. But people also hid their hordes when the the Norse showed up, right. you know, and they also hid their hordes when the Anglo Normans showed up, mm-hmm. and then that the leprechaun is the keeper of these, hmm. and as such, he's got a big load of treasure, right? But it's not his treasure, and it's not your treasure. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's a keeper of this for the people that have been, you know, disenfranchised or something, right? 
you know? The leprechaun doesn't have much use for gold, but he didn't want to give it to you. Hmm. You know? Well, it's kind of like a trickster kind of situation. Yeah, they're, yeah a lot of the stories about them are, are often trickstery, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, traditionally, this is the thing, traditionally they're dressed in red. Really? Yeah. Yeah, in in the traditional stories, they're dressed in red, and they have. Uh, I, red seems to be a kind of magical color. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. um, it appears far more often than green. Hmm. You know, um, like green is really the green has been projected onto them, yeah. as they've been filtered through, uh, like kind of Irish Americanism, really, and and mm-hmm. imported back into Ireland again. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. um, I suppose red is a more you know active color, where green would be more passive. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and it, green kind of represents Ireland as well. Like it's it's right. It yeah, would have been a natural transition when it's removed from its f- physical. You know, the, when it's removed from the physical culture and it's in the melting pot of America, so to speak. You know. Yeah. Um, it would have naturally transitioned to green. To identify it as an Irish one, mm-hmm. you know, um, it. I mean, it's obviously a lot of the similar characters, your gnomes and stuff like that from Central Europe and Scandinavian stuff. Mm-hmm. I believe they would have traditionally been dressed in red as well, you know. Yeah, I think they are. Um, so maybe it's to differentiate them from them, you know. I was gonna say probably yeah from from German stories or yeah, but any anyone. From you you would Northern Europe. Yeah, it's yeah, it's it seems to it seems to be related to them anyway, you know. Mm-hmm. And you like I said, like in, in Irish folklore they're a really small they're a regional thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um kind of Lins- uh, North Leinster and, and parts of Ulster as well, you know. Yeah. Um so the so part of the part of the um the legend with the leprechaun, you know, is it, he'll try to trick you. So he has two money pouches, mm-hmm. you know, and in some stories he has a he has a beggar's cup, <laughs> and the beggar's cup will have one of the money pouches or the beggar's cup will have um will be filled with coins, you know, mm-hmm. and sometimes it's a lot of coins, sometimes it's one coin, but and this is a popular theme in Irish mythology and and folklore. Every time he spends the money, mm-hmm. it, it returns to his purse. So his yes. purse is never empty. It's the never emptying purse, you know, <laughs> or the never emptying goblet, or the you know, yeah. No matter how many times you count the pigs, there's always more. Coming, <laughs> you know, or right. It's a it's a common theme. So he can spend that money. He can use that to bribe you. Okay. You know, if that doesn't work, and then leave you in ruin. Basically. Yeah, exactly. If that because you don't ever accept anything from a fairy, never, never, um, under any circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, then he has a gold coin as well, and the gold coin is supposed to represent his luck. Oh, and all of this, and, and that's go- where the thing in Good Omens is. That's where it comes from. Yeah. If you and haven't seen that show, I highly recommend it. So <laughs> part part of the thing as well is that like. He'll he'll offer you the gold coin, you know. Yeah. Now here is the final thing you should know about leprechauns. Their magic is that they can disappear if you aren't looking at them all the time. Right. So they'll always be trying to distract you, and the minute you look away, they're gone. Mm-hmm. And then you go, well, at least I got this co- gold coin, and you open up your hand, and it's a pile of leaves in your hand. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. And that's that's really how leprechauns operate. So do not leave them out of your sight. Nope. Do not accept anything from them. Nope. And then the only way to beat them is in, um, uh, you know, through the through the sharpness of your mind. Yes. That kind of way. But you have to trick them. Okay. It's kind you of have to it. pull the wool over them. It's that kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. Like. Has anybody ever done it? Yeah. I mean, you would. You, what? Like in the like, is there any kind of story like? Cucullin and the leprechaun. They're in, they're in totally different streams, like you know. Okay. Um, there's definitely there's there's stories of Cucullin and and stuff like maybe. There's stories of Cucullin and something like the banshee. Okay. 
you know but we 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 can get to that later like but a typical way to 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 trick uh, a leprechaun or a typical way that a leprechaun will trick you is over time Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. so they'll be saying okay 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 look you have me here take my gold coin and i'll meet you back here in three days time you know I have to go and organize a few things and make sure the treasure is still there, that sort of thing. Mm. And then they'll go away and the coin will turn, you know, yes. to leaves in your hand or something like that. Or they'll show up on the third day and they'll have a magical bag and they'll ask you to put your hand in it. And then you can't put your hand out of the bag. Oh my God. Something like that, you know. Never put your hand in a bag or a box. Don't ever <laughs> accept anything from the fairies. Um... And if in any doubt, wet yourself immediately. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is the only bit of advice. Sage advice. Carry a tongs. <laughs> and some amulets and a red ribbon. Yeah. And you know, a black knife, a black handled knife. Black handled knife. Would not be any, it, it would help you out. Yes. And if you're wrong about that, yeah. You know, at least you have a knife. At least you have a, a pretty, a pretty good knife. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wet yourself. <laughs> wet yourself immediately, because they hate that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you'll hate it too, but I'm gonna use that the next time I wet myself in public. I'll just be like, "Oh, I thought I saw a fairy." <laughs> <laughs> Wait, how often do you wet yourself in public? I don't know, but I'm I'm ready for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> it's the banshee. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, let's. There's there's another um, type of fairy then, and this one is kind of related to the to the banshee, you know. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's called the Du Hollahan. Du Hollahan. Du Hollahan. Yeah. Um, I, it's also called the Gan Kyaung, which which I prefer, which just means no head. Without head, like Gan Kyaung. Gan Kyaung. Gan Kyaung. I'm trying really hard not to say it in a South Kerry accent because. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because I can hear it in my head. <laughs> oh, yeah. Gan Kyaung. Gan Kyaung. Gan Kyaung. <laughs> um, this this is a. It's a, a magical fairy coach, to the other side. Okay. So. This is almost like. Does it drive itself? Or? It doesn't drive itself. It's, it's uh, actually. You know what? I'm going to give you a description of it. Now. Yeah, go on. Tell us the story. It's being driven by a man with no head, a coachman with no head. Sometimes two coachmen with no head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he's whipping headless horses with a human spine. Ew. Yeah. And the wagon is adorned with all kinds of funeral items. It has candles and skulls to light the way. The spokes are made from thigh bones. The wagon is covered and made from, um, like, worm-chewed human skin. Wow. Yeah. So This is pretty dark. This is the way, this is the wagon to the other side. <laughs> yeah? For, honestly, like, yeah? So, do you remember when I said that, that like, the Shia are a real thing? Yeah. And then do you remember... I spent way too long on the Irish folklore collection at uh, DCU on their website. So if you want to go check it out, it's actually a really cool resource. It's pretty interesting, yeah. Um, wear headphones. <laughs> That's all I have to say. About oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if it. I t- if yeah, it might be. It, so it's a uh, what it is is it's um. In 1936, between 1936 and 1938, these folklorists at University College Dublin went to all the national schools, so elementary schools in America, primary schools over here, or national schools. Um, They they sent out this assignment to all the classes that they were to go home and talk to their parents and their grandparents and record folklore stories that they told them. and it's it's fascinating. You can. It's really it. cool. Yeah, you can like search around for, and it's not you just search by area. Yeah, and it's it's folklore in the broadest sense. Like they they set questions like, "Tell me about the bravest man you ever met," and you know, right. And it's it's really interesting. There's a lot of really interesting things, and like, 
you're talking about 10, 11 year old kids as well. So you should go and look at the pinmanship on this as well. Like yes. the pinmanship is beautiful. Wow. Like, it really is. So, um, this, <laughs> this is one from Claire, I think, um, because I'm so good at taking notes, I've copied the story that the little girl in, in, I think Claire writ, wrote, writ, writ, <laughs> Um, but I forgot to actually um, record her name because I'm terrible at taking notes. Wow. Okay. Well, okay. You're learning. It's fine. I'm going to I'm gonna get better at taking notes. Mm -hmm. So here we go. So once upon a time, there lived near the cross of Bala Ravine, um, a woman who said that she did not believe in the headless coach. One night, she was sitting by the fire with her friends and she told them she did not believe in the headless coach. <gasps> And she boasted that she would remain up and watch out for it. And when it was near, hang on, when it was near midnight, she put her head out the window and she heard the noise of a horse coming along the road. Uh-oh. Yeah. When, hang on, sitting on top of the carriage with their heads under their arms were two, um, were two horsemen. And one of the men jumped down from the carriage and ran over to the window where the woman was and brought her back to the carriage. Oh. And they proceeded on their way until they came to the cross of Ballaverine. And then the man head. threw her out of the carriage and left her on the road. The next morning, her friends found her and brought her home in a shocked state. From that day until the day she died, she never said she did not believe in the headless coachman. <laughs> I, thought, I thought her head was going to get chopped off. <laughs> Her head doesn't get chopped off, no. No. no, no. no. Um, the danger... Disappointed. What, <laughs> what happens with all of these coachman stories, right? Mm -hmm. Every single one of them is that your friends warn you, yeah. or you've been warned, or you've been told. Yeah, of course. Then you get into trouble with the coach. Yeah. yeah? Now, there's a few things here. The coachman threw her out of the coach because she's not the fair for tonight. She just witnessed him, mm. you know, so he gives her a fright. Yeah. Yeah. If the coach stops and you hear the coachman call out your name, mm -hmm. you're dead. <gasps> and that's it. You're on your way to the to the other side. Um, here's another story about the coachman. Yeah. OK. So there's this guy. Let's call him Steve. Right. And Steve is staying at his friend's house. Steve, good old Steve. Yeah, Steve is staying at his friend's house and it's close to a fairy fort, right? Mm -hmm. And the people in the house say, Steve, after midnight tonight is when the coach rides out to do her, yeah? Yeah. Don't get out of bed. <laughs> Don't go and look at it. It's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Steve, being a curious sort, kind of goes, I guess I'll retire at 10 o'clock. And then after midnight, he gets up and he creeps downstairs and he hears a horse coming down the road outside and he opens up the window and he sees a headless corpse and he goes, oh, my God, is that a headless coachman who's got a human spine for ah my eyes? And he gets whipped in the eyes with the human spine <laughs> and he's blinded. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's what I was expecting of the old woman. <laughs> that's there's there's two ways that these stories go. Right. Yeah? Yeah. Well, there's actually three ways. We'll get on to the third way. Uh-oh. There's three ways the story goes. The coach picks you up and kicks you out because you're not its fair for tonight. Yeah. Or the coach whips you in the eyes and blinds you. Yeah? Yeah. And then there's a third way that it goes. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. So you get a story about the neighbor, yeah? He's very, very sick at the moment. Okay. Yeah? Mm-hmm. I'd say he won't be long now till the old headless coach is coming down the road. You know, and then, as usual, someone in the house is told to stay inside tonight because the headless coach will be around. Yeah. Yeah. Undubitably. Yeah, and let's say this is a precocious little kid, right? Yep. And they stay up late and they hide somewhere. Jimmy. And they hear the coach outside, and they wait a little bit. They don't. It's past the door now. It's gone a good bit down the road. And they come out of the house. Jimmy, don't do it. And they come down the road to the neighbor's house. No. And they're, they're, they're standing in the bushes in the neighbor's house. God. And the headless coachman is only but a few metres away. Mm -hmm. And and strangely, like, 
the strange voice from the head under the arm <laughs> says, Mr. Neighbor. And then throws a bowl of blood on him. <gasps> and then off into the carriage with him and away he goes. Ugh. And the kid survives. But they do have to get glasses. <laughs> That's... Th- <laughs> Those are your three. <laughs> and a bath. And, a, and definitely a bath. Um, those are the three stories. Like, and the the bowl of blood is a common enough one for the for the deaths. I just added it because just like. Well, that one is positively, absolutely ghoulish. Yeah. I like that one. That one's very Halloween-y. Uh, the the Halahan, yeah. It's the... Yeah, it's definitely cool. I, I Like, the, just the, the whole image of this wagon made out of, you know, bones and stretched yeah. human skin. They call it... Um, where is it going? Where blah blah blah. Notes, notes, notes. Notes, 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 notes. notes, 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 notes. Worm chewed Paul skin. That makes my skin crawl. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> so I guess do you want to get on to the the next one? Yeah, come on. Let's do it. The next one is the the Lana she. If at any time you're watching this and you need to take a break, feel free to press pause and come back. Because <coughs> this, this is a long one. This is this is the Halloween special. Oh, <coughs> oh my goodness. Um, so this is the Lana She, right? Lana She. Lana She. Okay. Well, the Hannah She, I guess was. La Hannah She. Yeah, and this is the fairy lover. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Now... 99% of these are female, but there are records of male versions. Okay. Yeah. And what happens is, the Lana She is like this fairy lover that comes to you, you know? Mm-hmm. And she infects artists and stuff like that. Oh, of course. Yeah? Yeah. And she kind of acts like a muse. She or he acts as he, a muse to them, yes. you know? Yes. And then they have a huge creative output and great success, mm-hmm. but then they die young. Oh, yeah. Like any member of the 27 Club, like your Janis Joplin's, your Jimi Hendrix's, your yeah. Kurt Cobain's, Amy Winehouse's. Amy Winehouse's, all of these people, they have all been the victim of the Lanashi, of the Lanashi, yeah? Mm-hmm. So this fairy lover, they've all been the victim of it, yeah? Yeah. So traditionally, she haunts wells and springs, yeah? Mm-hmm. Attaches herself to one man, and to this guy, she will be absolutely irresistible, yeah? Yeah. And the important thing about her as well is that she's only visible to the person that's in love with her. Ooh. To everyone else, she's invisible. Was that the dog? I, I don't know. <laughs> okay, sorry. That scared me a little. <laughs> so she comes, she seduces him, basically. And then he has this great... She's great a, success. Yeah, she's a muse, you know? Yeah. And... um and the artists make some of their best work and they have huge success, you know, mm-hmm. uh, creatively, uh, mostly commercially as well, you know, that kind of way, like, they, they, have, they have a lot of success. Yeah. And um, over time, she basically feeds off them, yeah? Yeah. Um, like... Notes. I'm on my notes, yeah. Um, now... The thing about the land she is, yeah, the only way to escape is to, when they offer their love to you explicitly, yes, you have to turn them down, yeah? Yeah. And if you reject her, then she she's forced to become your kind of magical slave. <gasps> Ooh. So then you have a, a she familiar. Oh. Yeah? Yeah. So that can be pretty powerful, yeah? Right. The only other way to escape the Lehana Shi is to fall in love with someone else. Hmm. But that's... Near impossible. That is near impossible. Right. Because of the magic. 
I put a spell on you. That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I have a story from the depths of time in Ireland about the Lehanashi. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, go on. And this is called The Adventures of Conla. Conla. Yeah. Now, some notes on this story. His name is Conla the Ruddy. <laughs> I thought we talked about this. <laughs> That's what they call him, Conla the Ruddy. <laughs> like he's got ruddy cheeks, you know? Uh-huh. So his name is Conla the Ruddy, right? Oh, why is he ruddy? Hmm? And he, Only answer that question. We'll see you in a while. We'll see you in, <laughs> co- in a while. And then he's got a he's got his father Khan, right? Yeah. So there's Kunla and Khan. Khani boy. Yeah. So Oops. Khan's Khan's nickname, by the way, is of the hundred battles, as in Khan of the hundred battles. That is arguably better than the Ruddy. <laughs> Depends on how you're looking. So uh, Kunla and Khan are sitting down on the hill of Tara, I believe, because I don't have that in my notes. Naturally. Because I'm a fool. But they're, <laughs> they're sitting down at some mythical place, okay? All right. And uh, this strangely dressed woman appears, mm-hmm. yeah? Mm-hmm. And uh, Kunla asks, where are you from? And she says that she's from Tir Yo, the land of the living, mm. mm-hmm. where the people feast forever without effort. And they live in peace without sin. And then Khan asks Kunla, who are you talking to? Because he can't see her. Oh. Yeah. And the woman replies, stating that she invites Kunla to the Plains of Delight and promising that he can stay on the Plains of Delight forever. Oh. Mm-hmm. So that's the story. Now, there's all these lads standing around. Right. You know, because... Khan and Kunla are up on the mountain with, with their retinue, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, Khan's like, lads, come over here. Can you hear who he's talking to? You know? Yeah. And uh, they're like, no, he appears to be talking to himself. So he calls over his druid, who I'm going to call the druid, because the druid's name also started with a C. And I just thought, this is just going to become a confusing mess. Mm-hmm. So for the purposes of this story, he'll be called the Druid. Yeah? Yeah. So he calls over the Druid, yeah? And... Yeah. So they they can't see her, yeah? But they can hear her talking, but they can't see her. Only Kunda can see her. Yeah? Oh, okay. So the Druid... Uh, yeah, so he, Khan calls over the Druid because he's afraid that he's going to lose Kunda to her, you know? Mm-hmm. Because he's getting more and more kind of thing. And the Druid does a spell, yeah? Mm-hmm. And this causes Kunla to not be able to see her anymore. And then this kind of uh, weakens her grip on him, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah? Yeah. So she's like, look, Kunla, I got to shoot, man. Um, But, you know, I'll see you again. Here, take this apple. And she throws him an apple. Yeah? Okay. And off she goes. So this apple just comes lobbing out of nowhere. Out of, out of thin air. It just, <laughs> it just pops out of thin air, yeah, and into his hand, yeah? Yeah. So now he's got this apple, yeah? yeah? And for don't the Don't take anything from, from the, the fa- sheep. Don't take anything from the fairies. Oh, Do not take anything from the fairies. You never learn. Well, <laughs> he goes, he, he stops eating and drinking for the whole month. Wow. And the only thing he'll eat is this apple. And guess what happens with the apple? Every time he eats it, it goes rotten. It becomes full again. He can never oh. finish this apple. He's always eating this apple. Oh. Yeah? Okay. So he survives off that for around about a month. Yeah? Yeah. And no matter how many times he eats it, it always remains whole. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Then, after a month, the woman reappears. Yeah. She speaks to Conle, yeah? And then she speaks, she starts speaking to him again. And Khan goes and calls the druid again. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, but the woman says, what are you doing? Trying to resort to druidry, like, you know, just to keep, she's like taunting him. But druidry. he can't see her. Her voice is just coming out of thin air, you know? Yeah. And she's like, why are you resorting to druidry, like, you know? Do you know, this is like weak human magic, this right? Cheap, here. cheap stuff. I think what she's, I think what she's, um, I think what she's saying is that this is weak human magic or something. Right. Because then, 
Kunla says, the druid says that, you know, um, that, that this, that the woman is, um, what? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Hang on, I, my notes, my notes. Yeah, so the, the, the druid is like that these are words coming from a demon and all this, you mm-hmm. know, and that she's pure evil and all this. Yeah. And then Khan saying that, that Kunla's even worse this time round because now he won't answer anyone. He's only talking to her. And no one can see her, but they can hear her walking around and talking to him. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Yeah. And then the woman... Um, yeah, so... Eventually, the druid casts a spell on Kunla. Yeah? Okay. To get him to be able to hear them. And then they're like, what's going on? And he says, well, I'm torn between this woman and my people. I don't know what to do. And then the woman beckons Kunla towards her. Mm-hmm. And then he walks over. And he steps out of our plane and into her plane mm-hmm. onto her crystal chariot. <laughs> Luna's snoring. Is that her snoring? Yeah. Sorry, it was really loud. <laughs> okay. So he can, he can see her standing in this crystal chariot, you know? Mm-hmm. And he steps out of our plane of existence and just literally onto her crystal chariot. Mm-hmm. And then all of the assembled retinue and Khan and the druid yeah. can see the crystal chariot. Oh. And they just watch as Khan sails off into the west. No. Yeah. Was he ever seen again? Nope. That was the end of him. I hope he's happy. Mm-hmm. Away with the fairies. Mm. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that. I don't know if that is our dog, Rachel. <laughs> Quick throw pee on her. Ew. <laughs> No, she's in her bed. Um, the thing that gets me about this is that this reminds me of of the story of Oshin and Neve as well. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Yeah, wasn't it called Tirna It's called Tirna but Tirna is the same is the same for all of these places. Tirna Bio, yeah, uh, like Bio is the it means living, you know. So so is Tirna not living? It's, they call it as well, they call it various names, like they call it the land of, um, uh, the land of like, the, oh, they call it the plains of plenty here. Tirnanog is the land of you. Yeah. Uh, Tirnamyo is the land of the living. Um, there's, there's lots of them, like, they, they call it like the, you know, the delightful plains is what they call it here as well. And they call right. it different things like, uh, the, the land of the land of the apple orchards was another one I think something like that there's lots of different names for it but what it is is it's the parallel she realm yes. it's the parallel fairy realm to ours you know yeah um, but yeah so it reminds me of the story of Oshin like but but with Oshin he he returns from the fairy realm and it's it's hundreds of years later you know and he thinks he spent four years in Tirnanog right and he visits all these different islands in Tiernan Old and stuff like that. Yeah. And then when he's having ret- a good old time for yeah, himself. Yeah, having a good old time for himself. Like. And then when he returns, <clears throat> uh, all this time has passed. And Literally everyone he knows is dead. That's that's such um if you go away with the fairies, you know? Yeah. Um, like you get caught in the fog and you're wandering around a fairy fort from for hours and hours and hours. When you get out it's possible that a week or two are gone. Yeah. Like that's a common ending to that story. Mm-hmm. You know? Um, or a common ending like you get caught up with the the um, the shul and the she, you know, mm-hmm. and you're brought all around the country, and when it finishes, um, you meet your own granddaughter, you know, that kind of way. Yeah, or, yeah. Do yeah. you know what I mean? You're and you've been gone for thirty years or forty years or whatever. Right. These are common endings. So missing time is a really big one, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know who did a lot of research on 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 this um, Liana she's You is well. <laughs> A, a little, a, a little known, uh, a little known Irish poet called William Butler Yeats. Oh, yeah, and You're he a said, a, little, a good friend of mine, yeah, yeah, and he said most of the Gaelic poets, down to quite recent times, have had a Lihana she, um, for she gives them inspiration to, her, she gives inspiration to her slaves, and indeed she is a Gaelic muse, mm-hmm. this magnificent fairy, her lovers, the Gaelic poets, they died young. She grew restless and carried them away to other worlds, for death does not destroy her power. Ooh. Interesting. Also, Lady Wilde. Oh. 
Uh, I don't think not not Oscar Wilde's why I don't know where I am. No. Um, we he didn't marry any. She's I interestingly Lady Wilde. Yeats is writing in eighteen eighty eight here. I think Lady Wilde is writing in eighteen eighty seven, and that's when that's the year that Bridget Boland met Michael Cleary in Clonmel. Oh. So the she are uh, very much alive, you know. Very active. Yeah, it's it's said that the Lehana she uh, was of the spirit, uh, was the spirit of life, the inspirers of the singers, the poets, and thus the opposite of the banshee. Ooh. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. Wow, babe, so many notes. I yeah, I mean. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. We're, um, it's, I'm not complaining. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, yeah. I mean, I do. I, do, I, do, I'm, I still. I have to get better at taking notes because I can't believe I let that poor kid's name out. Like, like. What? Do you know that kid from 1938 that wrote the story of the the coachman? Oh. oh I feel like. I don't know. Mm. Um. Now. I, just before we go on with the Liana She thing, before we move on to the 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 Banshee, which you know is the the famous one, really, right? Yeah. Um, the Liana She is a type of vampire. Yeah. So that's what she's doing, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, she needs them to become famous and puffed up in their own fame and become top of the world, and then she'll suck the energy out of them, you know. Right. And that's why. That's why I think it's useful to use the comparison of of these tragic figures like Janis Joplin or Jimi Hendrix or Kurt Cobain or, you know, Amy Winehouse. The mechanics are always the same, you know. Mm-hmm. They're young, they're in their 20s, they love music or whatever, you know, whatever their art is. Yeah. And then suddenly they're catapulted to this, like, Mega stardom thing. yeah exactly and then there's the there's the downfall you know yeah. with that's that's self-destructive and that self-destruction is them giving their creative energy back to the Liana she mm-hmm. so that she can live forever yeah. and, and come back again you know yeah there's a vampire kind of quality to her you know definitely um so you know what else is a vampire what the world <laughs> what wow <laughs> <clears throat> Is that, I was going for I thought you were going to go for that you know the world bathtubs Va- bathtubs are vampires yeah mm. do you know why your hands prune in the bath no because the water is pulled out of your skin oh you're not actually being hydrated in a bathtub I'm being dehydrated yep oh my goodness from Fission? Fusion? F- uh, what's the water one? I don't know. I'm not a sciencey person. Uh, There's one with water. Hi- uh, hydro tension. Uh, hy- hydrostatic tension? I don't, I don't isn't know. Isn't that that's that's surface tension, isn't it? Yeah. I think I know what you're talking about, though. Um, but yeah, anyway. Is it peristaltic? No. <laughs> that's the. Someone's gonna say the, it in the comments. That's the throat reflex. I know what you're talking about, like where you put, if you put the way water is attracted to itself. So if you put a piece of cloth in the water, the water will climb up up, yes. up the cloth. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's the same, but it just draws the water out of your body, wow. out of your skin, and 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 you know because it's, uh, oh, it's like water can move because it because it can grab the uh, there's this thing energy force field thing that pulls water so yeah. like raindrops on a window yeah water has that surface tension because the the arrangement of the the height like this i'm gonna delving back Sorry, into my, turned... my chemistry from 20 Way weird <laughs> from 20 oh god 24 years ago uh, it, it's something to do with there there's they've got a slight charge on one end of them and that's what attracts them to themselves right you know yeah. And that's what gives you unique qualities in water, like the surface tension and this ability to climb up things and, and the ability to pull the water out of your skin. Mm. Yeah. Is nice. there something to do with you, you're also using soap to wash away an oily coating that's in some way kind of protecting you or something like that? That probably has a lot to do with it, yeah. with the 
with the rapidity of how quick, how, how yeah, quick, it'll, how quick it'll, it'll you lose the water. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. sorry. Banshees? <laughs> yeah, so what's the crack with Banshees? I'll tell you what. They they scream in the night. Yeah. And is there they, a band called the Banshees? There is def- There are probably several bands called the Banshees. <laughs> There's Susie Sue and the Banshees. Ooh. Um, anyway. Anyway, so... Tangent. Again, I'm delving into the Irish folklore uh, collection. At UCD. Did you get a name? No, no, I didn't. I just wrote 1938 grandchild recording story of grandparents. <laughs> no, <laughs> I could have easily. Honey. Written, I could have easily written a name there. <clears throat> so they shall remain remain anonymous for their own safety. Yeah, and it, this <laughs> the, this I think that I remember that this story came from Claire as well. Like Claire has. A lot of folklore and a lot of folklore to do with the banshee and stuff like that, you know. Yep. Uh, so one night there was a woman dying in a house at Drumahair. I suppose I could look that up and see where it is. Um, at two o'clock, a pitiful cry was heard outside. Mm-hmm. Some of the people who were staying in the house did not know what it was, but they knew it was the dying woman. But they knew that the dying woman had heard it too. Mm-hmm. And she told them not to be alarmed, for that's the banshee. She came and cried again for three nights around the house and on the third night the woman died. The brother of the woman who was dying went outside and saw the banshee outside. And she was a little woman, dressed in red. The people say that the banshee follows certain families. This is part of the thing about the banshee. She's also usually dressed in either black, grey or red. I didn't know she'd be dressed in red. Yeah. I picked this because she's dressed in red, isn't it? Right. And she takes a lot of different forms. Um, The first stories about the Banshee appeared in the 8th century. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're associated with certain families. Now, this is the legend that the Banshee is associated with certain families that are mock or old. Oh, okay. You know? Um, And like... Crap. (laughs) <laughs> so, by tradition, there are five families that the Banshee follows. Yeah. Yeah, and they're the O'Neills, the O'Briens, the O'Connors, the O'Grady's, and the Kavanagh. Hmm. Yeah? Uh, but, true, and my own name, like McCarthy, I know that I've, I've read stories where they're associated with McCarthy's as well. But what they say is they're associated with these old Gaelic names, and that they have... Um, What's the story with it? That they have somehow kind of be true intermarrying, you know? Mm-hmm. So if you marry an O'Connor or an O'Grady, Kavanagh, you know? If you marry one of them, then your progeny can have a banshee. I don't know if you can have a banshee. I don't have no banshee. It's genetics, I think. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> so the, so that's, that's the crack with it. Now, the banshee isn't really the banshee sounds like a matrilineal thing yeah um yeah the the banshee isn't really out to get you do you know no she's like a uh har not a harbinger yeah that's what i was going to say a harbinger like a harbinger of of doom you know yeah it's a warning yeah no exactly yeah i finished the section looks really good on camera doesn't it yeah you left your scarf, lady. Oh, I thought come back. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's so. That's that's the crack. Yeah, you know. Uh. Banshees. I'm just changing sections. Yeah. The, yeah. So yeah, the the banshee exactly like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're all right. I'm trying to. Yeah. So the banshee's not really going to kill you. No. She scared the pants off you. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Um. Give you the creeps, sure, all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Now, the banshee will do damage to you if you mess with her stuff, because don't this touch your stuff. don't this is the this is another rule for the she. Don't mess with the fairy stuff. Stay away from their stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, there's common. There's a couple of common depictions of the banshee, and it can be the the most common one is like an old lady, right? Yep. But she can be young as well. Yeah? 
the the other thing about it is one of the depictions of the of the banshee is that she's an old lady in a river washing bloodied clothes. Oh yes. We talked about this. Yeah, she's she's one of the manifestations. She's Bav, one of the faces of the Morrigan. Yes. So that's who the Banshee is. Because the Banshee has the ability like like ba- like the Morrigan, you know? She's she's the ability of um to prophesize life and death. Yeah. You know? Um and that's what the Banshee is. You know? The Liana or the Lihana she is another manifestation of the Morrigan. The one that seduces you and helps you along. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. But also eventually brings about your downfall. So these are these these two here are the manifestation. Um it's also they're related to the Banshee anyway is related to the the Duhala, yeah? Yeah. The Duhalahan, sorry. Duhalahan. Duhalahan, the Gan The Gan the, the Headless Horseman, yeah? yes. Yeah, because the Headless Horseman will take you to the other side and she'll foretell when you were going to the other side. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, there's a couple of other... There's a few uh, kind of variations on it as well. Um, there's a woman with a long silver dress and long hair. Sometimes she's wearing a black dress, but either way, she's got long grey hair. And you rarely see her face. But you can see her hair, and she's combing her hair all the time, combing her hair, but looking away from you all the time. Ooh. And when you try to see her, she's always looking away from you. Creepy. Yeah. There's another manifestation of her um, where she's a little old lady mm-hmm. who's pointing, pointing at the de- at the place that's going to where the death is going to happen. You know. And then there's the other manifestation of her where she's this is the famous one where she's also an old woman, or m- sometimes a young woman. Yeah. You know? She could be any of the archetypes. Okay. Um, she fits the bill. If you can see her face, she has red eyes. But there are red eyes from crying. Like she's been crying for so long that her mm. eyes are all bloodshot and red. Yeah. And there's this Irish tradition um, called keening. You know? Mm-hmm. And like... I think it's still, still done, maybe not here, but around the world. Uh, yeah, it's it's where like someone would, yeah, where these 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 there's professional criers at weddings. Yes. Yeah, and they would show up like, and I remember that like I was reading one of those books that they make you read when you're in the Irish um, in secondary school, you know. Yeah. And they talked about the keeners, you know. Yeah. Who were and it, it was one of the island books. I think it was like some maybe it was on the Iron Islands or something, Lyons book or something, but um. Yeah, so anyway, one of those books anyway. Mm -hmm. And um, they talked about this, like that someone had died and they set up for the funeral and the keeners came and they started keening, you know? Mm -hmm. And they keened all night, like... They (laughs) keen. And they they call them the ban quinta, like, you know, like because quinta is like crying, the verb to cry in Irish, you know? Quinta. Oh, um... Sorry. Queena, Queena, Queena. Oh, Queena. Queena, yeah. So they call them Ban Queena, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. Cry, the crying women or whatever. Like. And um, so this was this was kind of a this was kind of a tradition and you'd have people, usually from kind of like poorer backgrounds, that would show up at funerals and they'd just cry almost like busking. You know, they'd cry yes. and people would give them would throw money in their hats and stuff, you know? Right. And they would. This would be a profession. You travel from funeral to funeral doing this, you know, mm-hmm. offering this as a service. And they don't know if whether the banshee came out of that as being a folk tradition or or whether there was some other kind of cross pollination where it worked backwards, you know. Right. Probably, probably that these that this had been an ancient folk tradition and it just had turned into the banshee mm-hmm. or been grafted on there somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see that happening. Yeah. So that's. So they think that that's where it came from, you know. And there's sometimes, like, in some of the places I read, uh, they were saying that it that it could have been, like, that the Banshee might have, that it was low rent because sometimes these women would cry just for the food and drink, you know, that they'd get. Yeah. Do you yeah, know? Yeah. But I don't think there's any, I mean, you know, you can't be looking down on people that are so desperate they're coming to funerals crying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly. Um, so that's the thing. There's, there's another, there's another one as well. 
which I couldn't find any reference to, you no. know? Okay. I could not find any stories. And they said that it was an old lady, a headless woman carrying a bowl of blood who was naked from the waist up and she would she would basically be singing at you. Now, I don't know... <laughs> What that's singing at you? No, sorry, she wouldn't be singing at you. Sorry, she wouldn't be singing at you. She'd just be, she'd be standing there, no head in her, bowl of blood, na- naked, like topless, with a bowl of blood. Now, I googled hard trying to find references to that because I had never heard about this version. I you hope know? you had incognito. I think that someone is, <laughs> I think that someone is is confusing this with the coachman that throws the bowl of blood on you and you're dead. Mm. Do you know? But either way. Uh, that's supposed to be one of the manifestations, but I couldn't find any. You don't have any Naga type uh, creatures in creatures, Ireland. Creatures, no, no, nothing like they that. They would be, they would be topless from the waist up. Oh, there's, there's, um, there's she, there's she f- fairies, like, you know. Yeah. Like there's, there's definitely the selkie, which that's more. That's there's versions of it in Ireland, but it's really more of the Scottish thing and. I know much about it, but they would take the form of a seal and stuff like that. Yeah. You know? And then, like, the the powers in the the skin. And when the selkie comes out of the water, they have to protect their skin. Yeah. Because if they lose their skin or if someone steals their skin, then they can't go back. Yeah, it becomes a cloak. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as I said, I don't know much about that. And I know that there's there's another... I actually have a pattern, a cross-stitch pattern. There's definitely another variety. And again, this is these are always women. Like, they're, the fairies are always women. You know, they're very rarely men. Yeah. Um, there's there's one, I swear it's called, like, the Mara She or something. Like, She and the Mara, like, or something like that. Like, the, the fairy of the sea or something like that. Mm. But, um, but I didn't look into that, so... <laughs> um... <laughs> This is this is the thing as well. Like, there's regional variations on it, right? Well, hold on, hold on. Can I show you? Can I show you the the thing I want to show you? Sure. What are you going to show me? <laughs> Look at this pattern. I have a cross stitch pattern that was given to me as as a gift. Oh wow! So Isn't cute. that pretty? Uh, the primitive hair selkie. It came out in 2019, and it's really nice. It's like a faceless woman. So it could be anybody. I kind of like it that way better. Mm. Uh, but yeah, her with a seal. Uh, that was cute. Anyway, sorry. Want, just wanted to show you that. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still going. That's fine. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So there's kind of regional variations on it as well, yeah? So in Leinster, yeah, the, this band Quinta, like this this crying woman, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, or keening woman, as, as they call it colloquially. Like, she would wail so loudly that it would it would shatter glass like this Ooh. piercing cry yeah yeah and in Kerry it was a low pleasant singing now what I heard definitely was kind of like you heard a fox the kind of thing I don't think I heard a fox I think I heard a banshee um, and in Tyrone the banshee sounds like two boards being struck together if you can picture that, like just a loud banging. Wow. In Tyrone, yeah. That's what they get, a loud banging, yeah. Okay. And on Rathlin Island, um, it's a thin screeching sound somewhere between the ho- the wail of a woman and the moan of an owl. Owls moan? Yeah, they'd be like, Ooh. <laughs> Wouldn't they? What, what, what would an owl moan sound like? I'm great at sound effects, aren't I? Oh. Mm. Like I can't. <laughs> Hold on, I have to pause. This is just too much. All right. Sorry if uh, anybody needed their depends there. <laughs> um. The uh, mm, the owl. Owl moans. Owl moans. This is in Carrie that they're. That they're saying that's what the, it sounds like. No, it? no, no. That's that's on uh, Rattlin Island. Like, uh, that's, oh, okay. That's an island that's <laughs> I don't know what they're up to in Rattlin Island. No, no. What kind in, of owls they have. But... In Kerry, it's a low, pleasant singing. Oh, yes. <laughs> that kind of thing, like in Kerry. Yeah. That's definitely what I heard. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, there's, there's two typical types of banshee stories. Hmm. Yeah. Um, the first type is... Um, 
that you hear or see a banshee. Yep. Um, and someone dies. Now, the banshee is usually heard for three nights. Okay. You know? And then the person dies on the third night. Mm. And then the coach comes and takes them away. Oh, that's what the coach is for. The coach is, yeah, she's she's the, like, I don't know, like, maybe, like, death's got a very hard job because these guys have, they've basically got a division of labor here. <laughs> you know? She delivers the death notice and then he comes and picks her up. You know? <laughs> So that's the way that's the way it operates. Like. <laughs> so that's your that's your typical banshee story, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then there's a second type of banshee story. Ooh. And in the second type of banshee story, um, yeah, they're a bit, they're just a bit more unusual. The key here is, um, you didn't know it was a banshee, or, and the other key is, and again. Don't ever take any of their stuff. No. Don't take stuff from them. Don't mess with their stuff. No. Stay away from the sheep. Yeah. Is the is the thing. Because the banshee is gonna scare the pants off you, but it's not gonna kill you. Right. Do you know? Hide your kids. Hide yeah. your wife. So one of one of the stories anyway is about this guy. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And he's walking down the road home late one night. Mm-hmm. But he and, can't mind his own business. Huh? Was he minding his own business? Um, yeah, I'll tell you the story about the guy that wasn't minding his own business. So there's a, there's a guy, he, he was, he's, he's walking down the road, you know? Yeah. And um, it's late at night. Yeah. Uh, the banshee usually comes out late at night. Like, you wouldn't see a banshee around the shops, you know, doing a bit of shopping or whatever. Like, they're, they're late Especially at night. Especially not the ones that are half naked. Yeah, exactly. And there's this, there's this little old woman and she's sitting on a wall, you know? Mm-hmm. And he walks up to her and he's like, hey, Hortings. And he can't see her face, like, and every time he goes around, I, I said, hello, hello, and every time he turns around, you know, she just seems to turn her head so all he can see is the hair. Mm. But she has this beautiful comb that she's brushing her long grey hair with the whole time. Mm. Beautiful gold, bejeweled comb, you know? Yeah. And then she's singing away under her breath, you know, like a moaning owl, you know what I mean? <laughs> she's, she's making a sound like... Like a woman screeching and an owl moaning. <laughs> but quietly under her breath, you know? And it's a beautiful sound. And she's combing her hair with the gold comb, yeah? Mm-hmm. And um, she puts the gold comb down for a minute. And he thinks, oh, I'm going to show this uh, stuck-up one that won't say hello to me. And he grabs the comb and he runs. And then he looks behind him and he sees this red-haired or red-eyed, grey-haired woman flying after him and her feet aren't touching the ground and she's screaming at him. Yikes. So he runs all the way home, you know? Yeah. And then he's inside and she's knocking at the door and he gets the impression that she wants her comb back. So he puts the comb, he goes to hand her the comb, but she looks fearsome. So he puts the comb on the end of the shovel and puts it out the door and (laughs) she grabs the comb and snaps the shovel in two. Yeah. You know? And that's one of the stories. Um, Don't take their stuff. Don't take their stuff. There's another version of that story where the guys are coming home from a fair, you know, and they take the, I think that I might have heard this from an Eddie Lenehan thing, um, where they're coming home from the fair and uh, they meet the Banshee and the same story happens. You know, they've had a couple of drinks and they think she's a snob for not talking to them. And then they grab their... um, they grab the um, comb off her yeah. and they run home and then eventually when they get home they're besieged almost like a zombie movie where they're besieged inside in the house mm-hmm. the banshee's banging on the door and she's rattling the door and everything you know Yeah. and then one of the women in the house goes oh my god you've got her comb what did I tell you about fairies you should have wet yourself and not taken this <laughs> stuff do you know <laughs> like why aren't all of you why, why didn't all of you wet yourselves um, so then she takes the comb and puts grips it with the tongs and hands it out the window. The tongs. And then the comb, <laughs> the, the tongs, the metal tongs, because they can't, they can't abide metal either, like. Right. So the, the tongs comes back all twisted out of shape. Ew. Or sometimes she throws the tongs out the window with the comb on it, and when they go out in the morning, it's all twisted out of shape, you know? Yeah. Um, but either way, don't take the banshee stuff. No. Um, that's it. Then there's, then there's another type of story and this is kind of like from where the folklore is dying or whatever, you know? And this is another manifestation of the Banshee as well. There's this guy coming home. It's always a guy coming home at night. Yeah. You know? And he he's, 
he's walking along the road. And Why do you think that is, James? <laughs> he sees this old lady and she seems very, very upset. Mm. And she keeps pointing at, at, this, at his neighbor's house, you know. Mm-hmm. And she's, she's not even wailing. She's just pointing. And as he moves closer to her, she steps away from him. Mm. And if he speeds up his step, she speeds up her backward step. Right. And she's pointing at their house, pointing at their house, you know? Yeah. And then he gets over to his own house and she's still about 20 meters away. And any time he tries to get closer, she backs away. So then he goes into the house and he goes, there's this old lady out there with gray hair and she's pointing at the neighbor's house, you know? Mm-hmm. And then the grandmother says, oh, I'll go out and look after her. You go away to bed. And then he goes away to bed and then she takes the tongs from the fire mm. and opens it up across the front door so that the banshee can't get in. Nice. And then basically the old lady waits it out. And the next day he asks, did you go and see the old lady? And she went, oh, yeah, I went out and had a word with her. And she's fine, really. She's just upset about the neighbor and the way he's very sick and stuff. And then the neighbor passes away <gasps> and they're singing for three nights. Yes. So that's that's your other type of banshee story. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Do you want to hear about some famous banshees? Yeah. Go on. And then we'll wrap it up. And then we'll wrap it up. All right, famous banshees. <laughs> Page 13. <laughs> oh. Uh-uh-uh-uh. Let me see. There's Avil, the first of the banshees. So Avil is a queen of the she, and she's from Munster, our very own province, yeah? Yeah. And um, she she goes on to become the uh, the banshee of the O'Brien clan, yeah? They, they, they commissioned their own banshee? Uh, it can happen. It can happen different ways. Oh, it, it's because they're the O'Briens. Yeah, it's because they're the O'Briens, and Brian Baru is the originator of the line, and Brian Baru was the king of Munster, ah. and then he's reputed to have been the guy that drove off the Vikings, right? Fr- at the Bla- Battle of Clontarf, and then that kind of makes him the first High King of Ireland, of the kind of. Battle. Recorded history-ish right. range, okay. you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know he's he's probably one of the most famous guys from Irish history and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so that's the crack, like, um, so that's how she becomes it, and she's she's Aelid then, yeah. So she's the original banshee. Yeah, she's Aelid. What? It's a pretty name. Or Avil, sorry. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there is an Aelid as well in, in Irish. Um, so she's the queen of the she um, what's this and she actually doesn't really sing yeah okay. but she plays a magical harp ooh and in keeping with a lot of she tradition other people can't hear the harp but if you hear the harp you, you did, did. <laughs> and then there's the O'Neills um, they have uh, they live at Shane's Castle in Randallstown, County Antrim, mm-hmm. and uh, that's that's been the the seat of the O'Neill family for years. They're a, a venerable Irish family, you know. They were like the kings of the north, you know. Yeah. They're basically the what are you going to call them? The Starks of Ireland or whatever, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And what happens with the banshee here is that one day the father is out hunting, he's got a couple of lads, and he sees this white heifer trapped. In a solitary hawthorn tree. <gasps> Don't do it. Yeah. Get away. So he's warned. Oh no. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go and get that heifer out of the tree. And people are like, Are you crazy? A solitary hawthorn tree. And he said, No problem. I'm gonna do it. And then he ignores the warnings and he goes and frees the heifer. Yep. Yeah. And the heifer runs off, and it jumps in the lake and drowns. And then when he gets home, he finds out that his daughter, Kathleen, has gone down to the lake. Oh, no. And she's drowned. No. So the she have taken her in revenge because, because of his sacrilegious act, you know? Right. Um, so they cut a deal with the she that she gets to return to the castle and live her life. His daughter. Yeah. But after her death, Kathleen O'Neill, after her death, she would be the herald of, of death for the O'Neill clan, so she would sing their the death and stuff like that. So she would be the, the banshee? Yeah, she's the banshee of the O'Neill family then, yeah. Wow. Kathleen O'Neill. <laughs> um, the last one then is is the banshee of Duckett's Grove, um, which is in County Carlow, you know? Okay. 
And this is, according to what I can see, this is an unusual room. Okay. Because this is actually a Pishog. Do you remember the Pishog? Oh, Pishog, yeah. Yeah, this is a curse like that's put on them, yeah? Yeah. Um, so there's this young girl that's having an affair with William Duckett. Mm. Yeah, and she dies following a horse accident on his estate while going to visit him. Mm. And the grief-stricken mother puts a curse on them, yeah? Yeah. To bring financial ruin, despair, and um, death. Yeah? Yeah. Um, and, you know, the usual. And also a banshee. Oh. So then, this one's a bit unusual because, like, any time one of the one of the, the Duckets, like William Duckett's, um what would you say, descendants mm-hmm. are going to die, um, a banshee... Uh, oh, sorry, it's even workers on the grounds as well, according to my... Excellent nose. The banshee, <laughs> the banshee will cry from the tower for two days. Oh, that's the first instance I've seen of two days. Usually, it's three days hmm. because three, it's, it's the magic number. Maybe the air is thinner up there. Yeah, and I guess that's the end of it. Um, wow. Yeah, except I did have one more small little digression. Oh, um, if you indulge me. Okay. Now, the fairies come from the two of them. Right. Right? They live in a parallel universe. Right. Yeah. According to the Annals of the Four Masters, which is again one of these medieval texts, mm-hmm. whereas the Lower Gawal Aaron tries to fit the mythology and the Irish people within this kind of mytho Christian kind of context. Yeah, hierarchy and kind of context, you know what I mean? Yeah. It gives it gives it stuff like um, fits it into European history, I guess, mm-hmm. or Western history, you might say. Right. Um, the Annals of the Four Masters is really a, a recording of all of the high kings and all this kind of stuff. So it's considered more of a historical than a mythological kind of um, document, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So the Annals of the Four Masters, anyway, um, apparently the two of they done and arrived in a fleet of 300 ships. Yeah? Mm-hmm. But that's not what the Annals of the Four Masters say. Oh. What did they say? They place... The, the Lower Gwala Aaron, I believe, says that they came in 300 ships. Okay? Okay. The Annals of the Four Masters says that they came to Ireland in 1897 BC and they were defeated by the Miletians in 1700 BC. So that's ruling for about 200 years. <laughs> um, and it's about 4,000 years ago. Yeah? Right. And it says, They came in dark clouds and land, landed on the moon mountain... The mountains. the mountains landed on the mountains of Sleeve um, on Iranin in Connacht, and they brought a darkness over the sun for three days and three nights. Three days. Yeah, and then so the Lower Gawal air, and but they landed on the mountain in dark clouds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now the Lower Gawal air and says that they came in three hundred ships. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it says without ships. A ruthless course. The truth was not known beneath the sky of stars, whether they were from heaven or of earth. Ooh. Is that Amergan? That's not Amergan. That's actually the Lower Gawala here and there. Okay. Now. Forgive me while I try to put these diamonds into this. Forgive me while I try and. Um, <laughs> Read your notes. <laughs> forgive me while I try and. Um, Look at how tight I packed that. Oh Piece this together. Oh, I don't have the autofocus on. Dude. So you got these guys that arrive, right? And right. according to Lower Gwalier, they arrive in these ships. And when they land, they burn their ships immediately because they're never returning to where they came. Right. Okay. And the Lower Gwalier says, as I, as I quoted there, the truth was not known beneath the sky of stars, whether they were from heaven or of earth. And then the annals of the four masters say they came in a dark cloud and landed on top of a mountain in Connacht mm-hmm. and made the sun dark for three days and three nights. Yeah. And they're magical. Yeah. Why are you looking at me like that? I'm saying <laughs> that there is every possibility. Oh. That the two of the Donnan <gasps> are, are our aliens. Space, they're our space brothers. No way. There's every possibility, like. Oh my gosh. Come on, they came in ships and they landed on top of a mountain? 
and they made the sky dark for three three days and three nights. Yeah. And now they live in a parallel universe. Mm. We forced them off of this land. Yeah. Well. They, they they live they're they're like we could be the aliens. We. Yeah, us humans, we could be we're living in their place, like. Oh. You know. Creepy. Anyway, that was just that was just something I thought I'd try. I would like to know how many of you listening agree. Do you I, think that? It's the time anomalies as well. The way people get mis experience missing time with the fairies. Uh huh. That's uh-huh. another. Uh huh. That's another. Thing. I'm getting it. Yeah. That that definitely. All right, maybe I'm trying to shoehorn something in at the end. Well, there. listen. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, it's working. Um. Thank you, darling. No problem, yeah. For all of your incredible research. Uh huh. My incredible research. Terrible note taking. <laughs> incredible research, though. That's all right. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It is a lot of fun. Thank mm. you very much. This has been a, a wonderful episode, I think. Probably one of my favorites so far. All of the Irish legends of the she. Yeah, the legends of the she. Different stories about the she. The fair folk. And look at how quickly I was doing that diamond painting. It's unreal. So, um, if you would like anything that you saw in this video, I will have it linked down below in the video description. Uh, If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or queries, please leave them in the comment section below. Uh, If you don't mind, give me a thumbs up on your way out and subscribe if you haven't already to see more diamond painting content in the future. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next week. Take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.